Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here. On this channel over the years we have looked at consoles and their histories from all over the world. This has included the likes of the Brazilian Zebo, the Canadian Game Wave and the Taiwanese Super Akan. Today our journey through global gaming history continues, but this time with a console from right here in my own back garden. In this episode we shall be looking at the bizarre history of a British games console and how it was looking to fill a niche in living rooms across the country. This ladies and gentlemen is the story of the GX4000 and why it failed. Yeah. As many of you will probably know the early 80s in the UK for gaming was bountiful. A whole range of popular microcomputers ruled the roost, with the most popular of all being the British ZX Spectrum, followed by the American Commodore 64. These platforms received a large following due to their cost effective nature, their multi purpose uses, but arguably, most importantly, the fantastic deep libraries of games. One of the many attractive features of these devices was that they would offer users the capabilities to code games from the comforts of their own bedrooms. All in all offering one of the richest indie development scenes in the history of the planet. In fact, the popularity of the ZX Spectrum is often credited as the machine that launched the whole UK IT industry. As a result, licensing deals and clones would follow, and platform creator Clive Sinclair earned a knighthood from the Queen for services to British industry. Obviously, it is not the Spectrum that we are focusing on today. However, it is important to touch on its significance in order to explain how the GX4000 came to be. With the success of the Spectrum and Commodore, a certain individual was taken note of it all, known as Alan Sugar. If you are from the UK, you will know Mr Sugar as one of our most famous entrepreneurs. Basically, think of him as the UK's answer to Donald Trump, prior to him becoming President Biff from Back to the Future. In fact, whilst Donald Trump was hosting The Apprentice over in the USA, Alan Sugar was hosting the UK's Apprentice show simultaneously. They were pretty like for like in terms of the nation's pop culture I would say. Whilst these comparisons are easy to draw between the two businessmen, such as hosting the same TV show, having very brash and arrogant natures and being important parts of 80s culture, there is one key difference between the two figures that gives me even more respect for Alan Sugar's achievements. Donald Trump came from a rich background and has always been financially propped up by his parents. Sugar on the other hand is a self-made billionaire from a completely working class background, so his rag to riches story is far more inspiring than that of the life of the US president. Sugar would grow up in a council flat in Hackney in East London and would start his first job working in a greengrocer's at the age of 16. Soon after this he would begin selling radio aerials for cars and other electrical goods out of a van which had been bought for just £50 and insured for £8. Sugar would go on to found Amstrad in 1968 and the company would go on to become a general import and export wholesaler who would soon specialise in consumer electronics. By the 1970s Sugar would begin to dabble in manufacturing offering low cost prices by using injection moulding plastics for hi-fi turntable covers. This would undercut all competition who were using expensive vacuum forming processes. Manufacturing would soon expand out to cover audio amplifiers and tuners. By 1980 Amstrad were listed on the London Stock Exchange and would double profits every year. By 1984 Alan Sugar would soon notice the opportunities in the field of home computing after the strides made by Clive Sinclair and co previously. In order to become a success in the field of computing, Amstrad would need to create a product that was differentiated from the competition and this is where the Amstrad CPC 464 comes along. The Amstrad CPC 464 differed from other microcomputers of the time as it was designed to be a more convenient all-in-one unit. If you own a ZX Spectrum or Commodore 64 for example, in order to play games you would need to link the device to a tape recorder to load your games along with a television to display the action. 
Amstrad noted the inconveniences of this and instead launched an 8-bit computer that would come with a tape deck built into the device, along with its very own monitor so that other people in the home could watch television. You have to remember that in 1984, it was not common for households in the UK to own more than one television. Amstrad founder Alan Sugar is quoted to have said he wanted the machine to resemble a real computer, similar to what someone would see being used to check them into an airport for their holidays, and for the machine to not look like a pregnant calculator, like a ZX Spectrum. When it came to the Spectrum, Clive Sinclair never wanted his product associated with gaming, whereas Sugar's device was heavily promoted to be used for gaming purposes. The Amstrad CPC-464 sold over 3 million units in a six-year run from 1984 to 1990. It managed to successfully establish itself as a computing option in the United Kingdom, France, Spain and German-speaking parts of Europe. In fact, the Amstrad CPC-464 was popular enough that it functioned as several YouTubers I know's first ever gaming platform. This includes the likes of myself, Top Pats and Champagne, Dan from Slopes Game Room and Guru Larry. We all owned CPC-464s before we owned anything else. By the late 1980s, the microcomputing era in the UK was starting to dissipate somewhat. Around the world, particularly in the USA and Japan, Nintendo were beginning to dominate with their Nintendo Entertainment System. And Sega were fast growing a popular following with the Sega Master System at home in Europe. The writing was now on the wall that the future of gaming in Europe seemed to lay in the hands of dedicated game consoles rather than microcomputers like they had done previously. With all this in mind, it seemed obvious that Amstrad should release a game console of their very own, which is where the GX4000 comes in, a video console manufactured by Amstrad themselves. The system, released in 1990, was an upgraded design based on the popular CPC technology. The system shared similar hardware architecture to that of the Amstrad CPC Plus line. The system was first revealed in Paris at the CNIT Center in August of 1990. The GX4000 was not the only new Amstrad hardware that would be showed off that day, as the 464 Plus and 6128 Plus computers would also be officially announced. The system saw a launch just one month later across Britain, Spain, Italy and France. The system's launch price in the UK was £99.99 and and most games would be priced at £25 per cartridge. The system came packed with a racing game known as Burning Rubber, along with a power supply and two controllers. In terms of the aesthetics of the machine, I have always thought that it resembles that of a spaceship, much like the PC Engine Shuttle also, which in both cases is a rather strange looking device for the early 90s. The moon landing happened nearly 30 years previously, and even Star Wars was well out of fashion at this time. The controllers that came packed with the GX4000 were similar to other popular 8-bit gamepads of the time. The GX4000 went for the same controller layout of that of the NES, Master System and PC Engine. The simple traditional two buttons located on the right and a directional pad to the left. For some reason, like the Master System, the pause button was located on the system itself. A design choice I still do not understand, considering that both the GX4000 and Master System saw releases after the NES. Explain that one. Surprisingly, the system was viewed quite favourably at launch, with CVG calling it a neat looking and technically impressive console that has an awful lot of potential at the very low price of £99. Ace Magazine offered a similar praise, stating that the system puts the other 8-bit offerings to shame, bar the PC Engine. So, the critics were impressed with the GX4000. Moving forward, a marketing budget of £20 million was set aside to be used across the four target markets, with the system being advertised as a home alternative to arcade gaming. The tagline was, bring the whole arcade into your home. Sadly though, despite all of this being in place, Amstrad sadly only ever managed to shift an embarrassing 15,000 units which is a huge step backwards from their 3 million CPC-464 computers they had previously sold. The system only ever had 25 confirmed different games released for the fouled piece of hardware, all in all reducing the system to no more really than an obscure piece of gaming trivia. Despite these failings though, like with the majority of platforms, the GX4000 still has a niche following today, 
which I guess we could partially put down to the success of the CPC microcomputers. So now, let me pass you over to a fan of the GX4000 and someone who decided to buy the console at launch. Let me introduce you to Novabug, a YouTuber who has a channel specifically focusing on Amstrad hardware and software. Let us hear his thoughts on the pros and cons of the device, and equally, as importantly, why the system failed. So when I first heard about the GX4000, it was reading Amstrad Action magazine. Now, a massive CPC fan that I was, it's the computer that I had, and um, so I, had, I didn't have any other console at the time, it was just Amstrad. And the magazine came out, the Amstrad Action magazine came out, had the cover simply stunning on the front with the picture of the console. And um, it, wow, it, it blew my mind because I thought, Am Amstrad are doing a console and it looks fantastic. I'd seen Nintendos, I'd seen any NESs, I'd seen Master Systems. I hadn't played and seen any Mega Drives at that point. At 19, in 1990, I'd seen uh, Atari 2600 and played on them. And when I saw this thing, I thought, that is going to be absolutely brilliant. It is going to blow them out of the water. It, it had a rundown of the specs of what, how it was going to perform. All this hype, all this excitement. It was going to be the best 8-bit console ever. I think what struck me first about the GX4000 is, is its appearance. And it was this lovely, sleek, spaceship-like design, like a, like a Starship Enterprise. I mean, you've got to look at it. It is like a, it is like a, like a futuristic Star wars this kind of freighter hovering through space with these lovely clean lines, curvy front, these bulbs at the back, on the front of it, on the top. It had this just lovely aesthetic appeal to it. It's very low profile, it's curvy, and it's very unique. It's, it stood out as a console at the time. The Master System was very angular, the NES was just a box. It was a console that I'd never seen look like the way it does, and, very, and also in white as well. Not many consoles pulled, pulled off that white. I mean, PC Engine was probably the closest at the time, but again, it was just a square box. So its, it's aesthetic appeal, just on looks, was just an eye-catcher straight away. And then you look into some of the specs of it, you look into the specs of the fact that it's got a faster processor than the NES, it's got more colours, it's got the same amount of colours palette than the, as the Amiga, a 16-bit machine. It's got this custom ASIC chip in it, it's got all these peripheral adaptions on the back, it has a SCART socket, it has a, has a microphone socket, it has a light, light gun point, it has analogue control, it has lots of expandable options. And it looked very exciting and the, the design of the boxes for the games, the design of the control pad, all look very fresh to me and I thought I thought it was going to really take off and really did and um, I wish it did I really wish it did to get hold of the box console itself is not actually that difficult there's plenty available uh, among the Amstrad community uh, retro game dealers and of course eBay there's tons of them on eBay and you can pick them up relatively cheap uh, boxed complete with everything in them some of them are even sealed um, there was a, a couple of years ago uh, a big haul was found, a basically unsold old stock was found and dispersed all over Europe. I think this was in France, because uh, the Dukes 4000 and like Amstrad itself, was very popular and big in France, so there were a lot of machines came out of France. So you can pick a lot of them up for relatively cheap, £50, sometimes even £40 for a boxed console. The console itself is not hard to get hold of. Uh, the problem is, the games are difficult to get hold of. They don't come up on eBay often, they're difficult to find at sellers at all and when they do they are expensive even some of the more common ones nowadays like the Batman Barbarian 2 Operation Thunderbolt even some of those go for a good 30 40 pounds nowadays which is ridiculous because they were the most common games at the time some of the other games are ridiculously rare they turn up so rarely that um, you wouldn't even bother finding them it's just sometimes they just fall in your lap and you've got to get them they can go for ridiculous prices you're looking at Anything outside some of the common ones, you're looking at about over £100 for most of them. For games like Copter 271, for games like Panzer Kickboxing, which is playing on this system right now, um, you're looking at about €200, Euros, easy. Um, some games like the Fable Chase HQ2, which is a game which we don't know whether it actually came out or not, but there is a video circulating on YouTube which shows footage of the game being played on a plus machine. That's the last recorded went over 800 pounds sold on eBay 
So the games are very rare and they're very expensive when they do come up, if they are box and instructions. There's also a lot of bootlegs hanging around as well, which generally either don't work or screw the console up. I think the GX4000 has a very unique part in the retro scene. It's the first and only attempt by Amstrad to enter the console market. Um, nothing else looks like it. Um, it was similar in vain to what Commodore and Atari tried to do at the same time by taking the existing hardware of their computers and bundling it into a console. However, the GX1000 is different to them too. Weathers, the XEGS, the Atari XEGS, was essentially an, R, an, an Atari 65XE or an 800XXL, I think, or something along those lines, um, which you could add a keyboard to, and it looked really nice with big coloured fat buttons on the front, a bit, you know, like something out of uh, Thunderbirds. Essentially, it was just the computer with all the other bits stripped away, which you could add on later. As for Commodore, with the 64GS, their console, that was bizarre because that all that was was a 64C without a keyboard and just the cartridge support. That was it. So they didn't they, they didn't even tailor it properly for the cartridge games. Some cartridge games that played on the existing C64s, you needed the keyboard to access. You couldn't connect a keyboard to the C64GS. So there was no improvements, there's no enhancements other than the instant loading, which the C64 already had. The GX1000, on the other hand, had this improved hardware layout. Yes, it was based off the CPC-464, but it had a, a, a custom ASIC chip in it, which improved its it, a hardware scrolling, parallax scrolling, hardware sprites, massive extended color palette. You've got DMX, uh, DMX, 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 DMX sound in it. You've got a lot of other enhancements, split rasters and stuff that the, the Amstrad could do, but, but the GX1000 could do a lot easier. Sprite smoothing things like that. This is why the graphics on some of the games, like Robocop 2, look 16-bit quality, because they're, they're approaching that level of competence, a bit like the PC Engine and the Turbo Graphics did in, in the graphic capability of that, without having that 16-bit capability. The graphics it could produce when programmed were absolutely outstanding. That is far unique, more unique than the other two consoles that were in the same vein. The other thing that was unique about the GX1000 is that it had all these uh, ports on it. It had like a full 21-pin SCAR on the back that you just plugged a native SCAR into, plugged it into your TV and off you went. I don't think anybody, um, any, other car, any other console did that. I don't think any other console had that. Um, and you can connect it in multiple ways to a television or a monitor, the CM14 monitor, which is this monitor right here. Uh, you could use that with its DIN plug. You could connect it to a TV with RF or SCART. That was, I don't, I don't think any other console had that many ways of being connected to a television. It also had natively two um, joystick ports out and two joystick pads that came with it. One right here. Two of these came with it. You had a game that came with it, it had power and all the leads that came with it as well. So it was a, like, like Amstrad's, like Alan Sugar's vision of the 464 being an all-in-one. The console was also an all-in-one. You put it into a, you, once you had that TV or monitor, it was bang off and you're away. You had everything. If the power supply <laughs> didn't blow up on you, because that's one thing that I know else was unique about it. But I don't think unique just to GX4000. I think a lot of other consoles suffered from a weak point in their package. And that was the, the power supply you supplied was very cheap, very nasty, and often failed. And a lot of the time, if you were lucky, it would just fry itself and your GX4000 would be fine. Other times, it would fry your GX4000 when it went. It was a poor piece of kit and I think a lot to the detriment of the console was when that piece failed, everyone just thought the console failed, threw the console away, end of days. I think if you're a retro collector, I think having the GX4000 in, in your library is pretty much an essential thing to have. It's uh, very unique uh, in its design, very unique because it came from Amstrad. It's a British console. That's another unique aspect about it as well. It's quite sought after, its games are quite sought after for sure, and of course now you've got access to all the games, and, and games converted from the CPC as well, via the C4 CPC flash cart, it's a sort of flash cart, it's, it's right here behind me, and um, so I think a collector, it's nice to have it in collection, it's something unique, something British, it's, you can proudly boast of it as a failed console, and Getting after the games, getting after all the original games, uh, all, I'd say uh, arguably 25 of them, you can't really include Chase XQ2, um, then that is a challenge. It's a challenge for any retro collector, and I think a challenge that they might, might salivate uh, for, uh, because uh, it's certainly a tricky one. I still haven't completed it myself yet, and I know a few others that have. Um, 
but I definitely recommend that uh, and some of the games on it are brilliant I mean Pang for instance is probably m personally my favourite home version of Pang you can get is on the GX4000 Robocop 2 is a great game Navy Seals is an amazing game it's double hard but it is an amazing game Burning Rubber is a really good version of Reclamon essentially there are a few very very good games on it um, and I think it's worth it just for that. A few unique games that you're not going to play on anything else. I think the fundamental reason why the GX4000 failed to take off and failed to capture uh, the market was essentially a combination of a few things. I initially thought years ago that it was to do with the fact that it wasn't marketed right, it wasn't pushed right. Well, I found out otherwise that in France especially, Amstrad spent millions marketing this thing. They had an Anka Ab campaign, they had massive magazine campaigns about it. I don't think it failed on that. It failed on primarily two things, um, the f one more important than the other, and that's the games. Um, commonly people will say that a, co a console or any computer uh, is based on its initial release of its games, the quality of the release games that come with it. That's what shows the public initially in the first glance what the system can do. The Super Nintendo is a great example. It chucked us Super Mario World, it gave us F-Zero, it gave us Pilot Wings, it gave us Super Tennis, it gave us SimCity. All absolutely fantastic games and all would showcase the power of the Super Nintendo. Only one game on release did this for the GX4000 and that was Burning Rubber, which came with the system. Everyone had it. They needed to have more. More needed to be released and more higher quality games needed to be released. And the problem is, you had very lazy a very lazy practice of just shoveling existing code onto the console off the CPC. It would just run the same game. It was the same system, it had the same processor, it could understand the same language. So they took games like Batman and Barbarian 2 and um, to, a lesser, to a lesser extent uh, Operation Thunderbolt and Switchblade and just dumped them on the, piece, on the, on the console. Just, just dumped them across with barely any changes. Some, some of them have changes uh, but, you know, Batman has no changes at all. Barbarian 2 has no changes at all. Tintin on the moon, no changes aside from a loading screen. That's poor. 15 of the games, 15 of the, of the library of 25, 26 if you include Chase HQ 2, were just ports, were just dumps of CPC games. That was bad. People ain't going to buy that. They ain't going to buy that because at the time you could buy Batman, Batman the movie, which had been out a year. You could buy that 299 399 on budget re-release. Why would you pay £25 for a car? Especially when the version of Batman is actually worse than the GX1000 because some of the sound effects are missing. That's, that was bad. And that's the reason. People weren't going to pay all this money for cartridges just because they could, they could pick the same game up on tape or disc for a fraction of the price. That was one problem. The games weren't developed quick enough. They weren't of higher quality. And when they did come, the good ones, it was just too late. The Robocop 2 is an amazing game. Pang, uh, Pang is an incredible game. Navy Steels is brilliant, and some of the others, Panzer Kickboxing, really, really good games, but they just, they were, it was too little, too late, not enough of the software houses embraced the console and what it could do, Ocean gave it a go, but then the Ocean were very guilty of also porting a lot across from the CPC, Lord CL did a few, Infograms did a few, that's what he got, not, not, not enough support for it, not enough support for it is the problem, that I think was the major problem, I think that if given a chance, it could have mopped up the 8-bit Fateful. The Master System was doing really well in Europe, but the NES wasn't really. It could produce better games, if given the time, than both systems. If people really put effort into the coding, they were putting the effort into the coding to the NES and the Master System. If it was put into the GX, you would have got outstanding results. But unfortunately, that it wasn't to be. Um, it could have mopped up that, that, that crowd. It could have mopped up that market before the onslaught of the 16-bits came along. People often argue that should have Amstrad made it made it 16 bit. Could it have been made to compete directly with the Mega Drive? I don't think that would have actually made it a success. I think it might have got a little bit more of the market share, especially in Britain and maybe in France. But I don't think the oncoming tsunami of the Mega Drive, as it came across to Europe, with the wave of Genesis coming from the United States as well, Mega Drive was always going to just sweep the competition aside as it did and as it rightly did it shouldn't have been made to you know compete directly with the Mega Drive I don't think that would, would have been a good idea it might have helped making it 16-bit but I don't think it would have been that successful what would have made it successful is uh, 
a bigger library of games, a higher quality library of games, and maybe being a re released a year or two before. Maybe being released in 89, 88 if they had the uh, technology to do it. Maybe. They did. The PC Engine was around then. Maybe it would have uh, had a few years of success and not the short four-month lifespan that it technically had. I tip my hat to you, Top Hat Gaming Man, for letting me grace your wonderful channel. And I hope you'll join me over at my channel, Novabug. Please, um, I'm sure Rich will leave a link somewhere. Novabug, out. You can add that if you want. I don't mind. I'm just adding that. I'm just putting that on. Right. right. Thank you, Novabug, for your insights into why the system failed and helping to introduce my viewership to the exciting world of the Amstrad GX4000. Hopefully now they will do the right thing and subscribe to your channel and learn even more about the riveting subject that is Amstrad. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that was the history of the Amstrad GX4000 and why it failed. If you are like Novabug and have a pension for collecting for a failed system, then let me know in the comment section. Maybe you too can work on a collaborative video on this channel with myself. Do not forget to like, comment and subscribe for videos on obscure gaming trivia that are released on here every single week. Once again, a special thanks to Novabug and equally as importantly, a massive thank you to this channel's patrons. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, JD Robbins, Greg Hooper, Sebas the Great, Sid Spaces, Kevin Verhaley, Andrew Bizanski, Edward O'Reilly, Tom Elliott, Wang DX, SpongeBob B, Michael Baker, Hans Christian, Computer Man, and all of my other patrons. Thank you all for changing my life. I love you very much.